evening, everybody, and welcome to the ASAP2 webinar on FBAR expenditure reporting requirements. We are going to wait a couple more minutes to start the webinar. Uh, while you're waiting, could you please use the chat and introduce yourselves by name and country and your organization? We always like to know who's in the audience. Thank you. Hello, welcome everybody to the uh, PEPFAR Expenditure Reporting Requirements webinar. We'll get started in just a moment. If you could use this time to use the chat box and indicate your name, your organization, and your country, we'd love to know who's in the audience. Thank you. We'll be starting very soon. Um, so I just wanted to quickly flag it. appears that some of the participants are mentioning that the chat is disabled right now. Um, so I just wanted to double check that it has been enabled. Okay, welcome everybody to the ASAP2 webinar on PEPFAR expenditure reporting requirements. Um, we have a lead presenter, Aaron Dunlap, from Senior Technical Advisor from the Expenditure Analysis Branch of the Office of HIV AIDS. I think this is her fourth time doing the webinar on our platform and we're really delighted you came back. And David Song will be supporting her with answering and responding asking uh, Aaron questions from the questions that you will put into the Q&A. A few little housekeeping things. Um, I mentioned the chat a few times, so we'd love to see who's here. Um, please use a Q&A box to ask questions rather than the chat for answering questions. Uh, it, it gets confusing if it's in two places and we might miss your question. We'll have two polls during the webinar today, so you'll be asked to provide feedback and you'll see the results right away. Uh, and today's presentation will be posted on our website after the webinar. So just a quick word about ASAP 1 and 2. Um, we started in 2019 and we'll be ending next month. Uh, we had the goal of supporting local partners to become prime USAID partners with PEPFAR funding. We've worked in 18 countries. 
and we have supported 113 NGOs and 13 uh, local government uh, partners. Um, I mentioned the webinars before. All of our webinars are on our website, and you can visit interhealth.org backslash ASAP resources, and you can plug in the title or the topic to see what is available. They are, um, the webinars are also available in French and Portuguese. Here's our upcoming webinar schedule. Uh, we have a busy schedule ahead of us as we wind down the project. So today is the ER reporting. We have business development in French starting uh, the 18th and then finishing on the 25th. We have the human resources for health reporting requirements this Thursday. Then on September 24th, we have the uh, final ASAP2 closeout legacy path to prime and road to sustainability webinar. So this webinar is where we'll be uh, sharing all of the available tools that we've developed for the uh, 113 local organizations and make them available to all of you. Um, here, we'll also have um, the ER and the uh, HRH webinars in French and Portuguese. So a little bit about our path to prime road to sustainability. So this is an online one-stop shopping document, which includes everything that uh, a local partner needs in order to understand and work with USAID. So you'll see the contents over on the left-hand side. And then with each of the content titles, um, you'll see policies, templates for organizational policies and procedures, capacity standards, training material, and online training opportunities. All of these have been translated into seven languages. And the document is intended to be an online resource, which is periodically updated with new policies and new tools. This is a glimpse into what the document looks like. So these are on the left-hand side, the 212 documents that we have created for organizational functions, procedures, and policies. We also have the list of all of the USAID compliance requirements in one place. We have our NUPIS Plus 2.1. We have all of USAID's policy documents, which are being translated into many languages. And then we have a list of additional resources. So very handy tool. So once ASAP closes, uh, you'll still have this to help you uh, implement as a local partner. Thank you very much. And I'm now going to pass this over to Aaron Dunlop and David Song. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you, Catherine. And hello to everyone who has joined the call. Um, it's really exciting to go through the chat and just see all of your different organizations and where all of you are located, the different roles that you represent. Um, it's it's just really exciting to see that all of you, um, as we are ending the fiscal year very soon, and I know that we're going into a heavy reporting season that we just want to thank you for your time on this webinar to launch Q4 reporting for ER. My name is Erin Dunlap. I'm a senior technical advisor on the expenditure analysis branch, and um, we'll hand it over to my colleague to introduce himself as well, who will be assisting today. Uh, thank you, Aaron. Hi, everyone. So my name is Song, and I'll be helping with the Q&A today. So um, whenever folks are popping in questions, I'll be helping to either respond or direct those questions to Aaron. I work at HQ also in the expenditure analysis branch as a program and management analyst. Great. Thanks, Song. So just a reminder, again, to help us make sure that we have visibility on your questions, please be sure to put those in the Q&A. Um, and so before we get started with the presentation, we have a quick poll and that's just help. That's just very helpful for me to understand what the level of experience is with expenditure reporting. If I see that there's a lot of people on this call that are reporting for the first time, then that will help me to know where we might need to ensure that um, the guidance is extra clear or spend a little bit more time. It looks like we've got a lot of experts on this call. Thank you all for joining the poll. The poll. Um, it's really great to see, um, but lots of lots of first time folks on here that are going for the first time. 
um, it looks like we're approaching at least 100 um, who are saying that they haven't reported to expenditure reporting yet. And so this might be your first time. Um, and another thing that could be helpful as folks are still completing this poll is um, if you have any subrecipients that are starting in the new fiscal year, or perhaps your organization is starting for the first time, even if maybe you did not have any expenditures in fiscal year 24 and you don't uh, expect to be reporting to ER for this year, it's still helpful to know the information now so that when you do report as an organization a year from now, you will know the requirements and you'll have a year to sort of plan and prepare and discuss internally how your organization will plan to do this because it will take a little bit of an effort for organizations to sort out how, how you will be able to report programmatic expenditures. You have expenditures in your accounting systems by um, different classifications like salaries or travel, but what you don't have are those classifications by let's say care and treatment or for AGYW, for example. So that's where there is some complexity with ER. Okay, we're actually a bit of a split audience here, kind of for the most part, overwhelmingly, I think folks two thirds have um, essentially have some experience, whether it's one or more years, and about a third of the audience will be reporting for the first time. So um, thank you for responding. If you haven't responded yet, there's still time. Um, and so let me switch over to my presentation. So give me one moment. Someone please let me know if you do not see my slides. Okay, and so thank you for the poll. And one, uh, one way in which I would like to sort of kick off this conversation that we're going to have together is for you all to type actually in the chat this time, what was your biggest challenge reporting to ER in the past? Or what is your greatest concern if you're doing ER for the first time? And there are a lot of different, I think, um, you know, questions or concerns or um, we've heard kind of heard a lot of different um, answers from partners. So we would like to hear from you. I'll give I'll give maybe, um, you know, 15, 20 seconds or so for folks to type just really quickly a couple of words in the chat on your biggest challenge in the past or your greatest concern in the future. And then Song, I might put you on the spot to help go through the chat. I can't see the chat currently, so uh, we'll give it a few more seconds here for folks to respond. And then maybe you can help us synthesize some of those responses maybe about 10 more seconds. And okay, what, what are we seeing in the chat song? So I'm seeing subrecipients popping up several more times as well as alignment to other data sets such as to HRH and to ER is also popping up quite a few times. Um, issues with template uploading, um, and then um, also just general question on the financial classifications slash categories. Um, but yeah, great, a great. lot of comments on subrecipients. Okay, great. We are going to touch on all of these today. Um, again, if you have additional questions, we're going to break this presentation into sections. And so I will take a pause after each section um, where we can pause for questions and answer. We'll go through a little bit of the framework. Um, it sounds like there were a couple of questions on that. So that's um, uh, for those, the third of the participants who are new, we'll just do an overview of the financial framework and what the different components are. We'll talk about what's new for fiscal year 2024 20, reporting. Um, essentially nothing major has changed. So a little sneak peek on that, but there are a couple of clarifications um, that we'll go through. I'll do a demo of the expenditure reporting template, which is already live and available on Datum Zendesk. We'll talk about some of those resources from USAID as well as those resources currently on Datum Zendesk. Um, a little bit about financial data use, and then we'll have Q&A. 
Okay, so let's go in a little bit to the financial framework. And so um, for those who are doing this the first time and you are already submitting a financial report via, uh, let's say your SF-425 or your 424A, something like that, depending on your contract type, the reason why we collect financial data is for a number of different reasons. PEPFAR is a U.S. Gover government um, initiative, and we have certain requirements that we have to send to our U.S. Congress on how we are spending our funds. So in our budgeting process, we are required to have what's, what's called earmarks. We need to plan up to a certain amount for care and treatment. We need to plan up to a certain amount for or orphans and vulnerable children. And so when we have, so we have an accountability process in what we are spending with U.S. taxpayer funds that must be reported back to our U.S. Congress in order for them to continue funding PEPFAR year after year after year. We also, this data is very different from your contractual data because it is more programmatic in nature. So we are able to take program financial data such as our investments in care and treatment, our investments in testing or key populations and be able to link that back to our program impl implementation. What are some of our, uh, our strategic objectives? Um, are we able to identify any efficiencies in our programming? We have to collect that financial data on the expenditure side in order to really make that link with um, those programmatic and strategic decisions. Just a brief overview of what happens with financial data. You as the implementing partners um, come in during expenditure reporting, but the reason why we talk about financial data, uh, use the term financial data and not just expenditure data, is because we're budgeting the same way in which you are reporting expenditures. So from January until about May, the U.S. government, um, so you, uh, your USAID counterpart, or counterparts and colleagues are working to set their objectives for the next uh, implementation year and say, these are the activities that we're going to do. And we are setting budgets at USAID according to the different components so that when it comes to expenditure reporting, we're doing a comparison that's one-to-one, -one, that's sort of cop that's um, looking at our budgets and our expenditures according to the same classifications. In the middle, you can see work planning, and we no longer require expenditure, or we no longer require a budget template um, for the work planning process, but we do ask that there is a little bit of detail in your budget narrative um, that describes your planned expenditures according to the different uh, classifications. So what are, when we say the financial framework, and when we talk about our, our financial classifications, what do we specifically mean? It's from the perspective of your organization on the expenditure side now, and we're really trying to understand the purpose of the spend via the program area, who is benefiting from those investments, that's through the lens of beneficiaries, we have something called an interaction type, which is we're trying to identify dollars that are directly interacting with beneficiaries or not. And then uh, finally, we have cost category, which is what is the partner purchasing? What in general is PEPFAR purchasing with its dollars? So the first designation that we have is really trying to understand the differentiation between site level and above site level activities. Site level activities are those that happen at the point of service delivery. If you can think about a given facility in a certain province or district, and say that there, we are paying for salaries or we are doing testing work and there's supplies, there's travel within a given that's happening outside of a given facility or a lab, we can specifically point to that and say this facility is, is benefiting from the dollars. We consider that a site level activity. Above site level work is when we're talking about activities or dollars that are really impacting the entire health system of a country. 
we can't really pinpoint that one facility versus another is benefiting. It's essentially the entire health system. So a good example of that is like policy development. If we're updating or strengthening some of our policies, those are going to be carried out by all facilities across the country. There's different surveillance or survey activities, just overall health system strengthening. Um, those activities and those dollars are considered above site. So when we're talking about site level versus above site level, this has actually been a bit of a point of confusion for partners. So we just wanted to clarify this a little bit more. So those site level programs are broken down into what's called service delivery and non-service delivery. And so again, site level, we're talking about a point of service delivery. So um, like a lab or a specific clinic and so there are activities where, let's say, a doctor or a pharmacist or a lab worker are interacting with patients directly. And that is called a service delivery activity that is happening at the site level. But there are also activities that happen at a site level, like a, like a, a facility, like a clinic, where there are non-service delivery activities that are happening, where we are strengthening the quality of the services that are del being delivered. So let's say that there is a doctor that is um, treating patients. That is service delivery. That doctor is specifically counseling patients. But an example of a non-service delivery activity may be that same doctor who is in a different facility providing mentorship support to the other service providers, supportive supervision, um, quality, quality uh, reviews. They are performing a non-service delivery function because even though they're a doctor, they are working to improve the services, but they are not interacting with the client. They're just sort of overall gen generally improving those, those services at that level. So those are site level programs the, dif the difference is service delivery or non-service delivery and above site. We have definitions for all of this. We're going to go into um, some of the resources later in the presentation. So if this is feeling a little overwhelming, um, it, it actually is, is um, broken down um, a little bit simpler in our guidance document. We have specific examples that you can read and, and help determine whether or not an activity is service delivery or non-service delivery. So that's site level. And then the above site level are always going to be non-service delivery activities. These are going to be different activities than those that happen at that site level. Remember, it's thinking about, we can point to a certain facility on a map and say, this is where the dollars are being spent versus more health system related dollars being spent where everybody benefits. That's sort of the difference between service site level and above site level. Okay, so let's talk about the kind of the main components of the PEPFAR financial framework. Again, there's definitions for all of this, so don't stress. Um, we're just going to touch at this at a very high level. So the the um, this is essentially what it this will look like in the in the expenditure template that you complete. As I mentioned, USAID sets budgets according to these four different to these three different or actually these um, three different components. Um, and so partners will be reporting on that fourth component, which is cost category during the time of expenditure reporting. But the budgets are set by program area, the service delivery, non-service delivery, the beneficiary, and then a dollar amount. So the first lens in which we look at uh, PEPFAR financial data in the programmatic sense is program area. PEPFAR wants to understand our budgets and our expenditures. In this case, we're talking about expenditures for those of you getting ready to report according to program area. We have four site level program areas, prevention, testing, care and treatment, and socioeconomic. There are then two additional program areas where you would report your dollars for those above site activities that you may do as an organization, 
And then essentially every, almost every single organization on this call, except for maybe commodities, will have program management costs, which are those expenditures related to your organization, the staff, the office rent, et cetera, to implement the award. The second lens in which we look at PEPFAR expenditure data is beneficiary. And you can see we have these seven targeted beneficiary groups. We have children, AGYW, key populations, orphans and vulnerable children, pregnant and breastfeeding women, military, and then something called non-targeted, which is kind of more like a general population amount where we're not targeting one of those other populations. It's just services or activities that are benefiting kind of everyone. And we'll talk about the targeted beneficiary groups um, here in a little bit, in a little bit more detail. So those are the first two lenses, program area, beneficiary, and now we're looking at the third lens, which is cost categories. So this is what did we buy with our PEPFAR dollars? And most of these categories may look similar to some of your other kind of quarterly reports or annual reports that you send to USAID. Um, and, and it's essentially just us trying to understand what are some of the cost drivers. We look at this information, we'll talk about this again at the end of the call, how we use the data, but USAID will look at this information at a mechanism level, but sometimes we like to look at this data at kind of a country level. And we wanna say, in all of Eswatini, what are the biggest cost drivers? We're spending the most money on commodities. After that, it's salaries. After that, it's you know training or something like that. So we like to be able to see this information to, to better understand our cost drivers in each country. So let's put this all together. This is looking at essentially the expenditure reporting template or the way in which data is entered by partners for ER. And so if we look at that red box, we can go down the column and see those different components that we talked about. Number one at the top is that program area. And in this case, we've entered HIV testing services, facility-based testing for service delivery, the second, the second um, lens that we've entered here is adult men. So we're talking about dollars and sort of a grouping of activities related to facility-based testing, service delivery, targeting adult men. And then down at the, we can see the different cost categories entered just for this specific set of activities. 557,000 for clinical healthcare worker salaries, $36,000 for fringe benefits, et cetera. And the total of that is at the bottom, which is 4.6 million. This is called an intervention. So it's that testing, adult male, and a dollar amount with the breakdown by cost category. So when you're entering in your expenditures, it's broken down by these different interventions. I think you can have up to 30, 30 different interventions the intention is that you're not breaking out every single activity by service delivery, non-service delivery, and beneficiary, because otherwise you would have hundreds of interventions in your ER template. And we don't want to necessarily go to that level of detail. So it's okay if we sort of make a general um, grouping of activities to say more or less with good accuracy, this is what we spent on facility-based testing for adult men um, for this mechanism. And we'll, we'll talk about how this gets entered into the template um, in, a little, in a little bit. So that is a very brief overview of the financial framework. We're going to talk a little bit more about reporting in the next section, what's new. We'll go through the detail of the template. Um, so we'll maybe hold on any questions related to that. But Song, can I ask if we have any other questions right now about the actual financial framework? Um, yes, so okay. first I wanted to flag, I see that there. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I want to flag that it appears that seven hands raised in the chat. I'm unsure when those hands were raised and if those are direct questions. Um, but please, if everyone can make sure that questions are asked in the question and answer window um, and not 
not in the chat or with a hand raised, that'll help me with going through these questions. We have one question related to lab activities, um, how to classify between service delivery and non-service non delivery. Um, we also had another question on ER and HRH, which I think we could get to later, because I know, Aaron, you'll be talking about HRH later in the presentation. And then lastly, um, there was a question related to whether or not to report PM based off of budgets or actual um, PM costs. Great. Thank you for those questions. Um, the short answer on lab is when, and we'll look at this document, but there is something called the Financial Classification Reference Guide, which is found on Datum Zendesk. We'll go there in a minute. And that is where you can see activities that are included and excluded in those different service delivery and non-service delivery. It's not a, a full list of every activity, but it would give you an idea. Um, essentially, if you are running tests and if you are, you know, kind of, again, thinking about that direct service delivery of performing lab tests um, for patients and, and that is related to results that they will be getting, that to me would be a little bit on um, the service delivery side non-service delivery lab activities would be, we're trying to improve the quality of lab services delivered, but we're not, we're not processing labs or we're not buying reagents or anything like that. It's more um, someone's time that's being spent perhaps going to a facility to work on quality assurance or just improvement of quality overall. Um, where we're not, we're not dealing with a patient's results or a patient at all that is an example of non-service delivery. Um, we so so talking about um, uh, the the budgets versus the expenditures. So as I mentioned at the very beginning, USAID will set budgets that look very similar to the screen that we're looking at right now. So that is a really good reference point for you as the partner. You don't have to necessarily look at a blank screen and say you know, where do we start? USAID set every single mechanism budget according to the to this structure by intervention, by program area and by beneficiary and by that bottom amount. We don't set budgets by cost category in the middle, but we do have a budget for, let's say, facility-based testing service delivery for adult men for a budget of 4.6 million. And so if you have not yet received your budget by intervention for fiscal year 24, I would encourage you to reach out to your USAID, AOR, COR, activity manager, whoever your USAID point of contact is and say, I'm getting ready to do ER. I know that you have a budget by intervention. Can you please send that to me so we can have as a reference in order to start ER reporting. So the idea, and this, this applies to the question on program management as well, but the idea is that this is, it's just like anything with budgeting. If we think about our own personal budget on a monthly basis, we're going to do our best to say, I'm going to spend this much this month and I hope to spend this much this month, but sometimes there's unexpected changes, right? And so sometimes I'll spend less Sometimes I'll spend more. We are doing our best to have a budget, but at the at the end of the day, um, I we want you as our implementing partners to report expenditures as they actually happened. So let's say for this for this intervention of four point six million that the partner ended up spending, you know, five point five million. I would want rather see five point five in expenditures then telling me, well, we just spent 4.6 because that's what you want us to tell you. And the reason why we want to see what was actually spent was because that helps us to understand what happened in implementation, particularly as these expenditure reports are often referenced for the next budget cycle. Many USAID, AC, AORs, COR's will look and see what the partners spent on program management 
and they will try to budget for that amount for the next year. If let's say you had X number of testing targets and this amount for testing as a budget and you didn't achieve your targets, but you spent all your money, we need to understand, did we fund the partner enough for testing? Maybe that, that partner needed more testing dollars to achieve their results. Maybe something else happened in implementation, we don't know. But um, we do want you to report the actuals um, as best as possible. Expenditure reporting is complicated for many of your organizations because again, your accounting systems are not set up to have programmatic information um, sort of triangulated with your financial reports. It, it takes time for you to say, you know, the cost category by the program area or the beneficiary. So ER is its self-reported data. We hope that your organization does the best that you can to report, but it's not an audit. This is very different than, again, your contractual financial reports. We, we would like this to be accurate, but this is not subject to audit. It's just, it's a reference point for USAID as to what are our partners doing when we add all of the mechanisms together in a country, it is a story about what USAID is doing. When we add all of the partners for all of the US government agencies and all of the different partners that are working in let's say Zambia, when we add everything together, it's, it's to help us say, this is what PEPFAR is spending in Zambia. And so this information is important to get as accurate as possible, but we also say do your best. Song, if there's no other questions, I might go into the next section where I think we will have the majority of quest other questions answered unless there's anything that is super pressing. There are a couple other questions that are in the chat. Um, depending on time, do you want to take at least one more? Sure, and that sounds good. And then we can come back to some of these. Um, that sounds good. So this is also related to ER and HRH. Um, so one participant was noting that they don't see any HMIS funding for site level, but they do this. They do M and E work um, since the data comes from the sites, and they're saying that this causes confusion when they're doing ER and HRH. Right, exactly. And so this is one of the many differences between, well, some of the differences between ER and HRH. And one of the um, discrepancies that we do see between site level monitoring and evaluation and those above sites um, activities. We are actually going to talk about that toward the end of the presentation. So perhaps I can ask us to hold until that because I actually have something written um, about that. Um, maybe let's just go through the, the template and kind of the remaining slides that we have, because um, I do think some more questions will be answered here. So let's talk about what is new for expenditure reporting for this year. Um, or well, let's talk about, in general, the methodology for reporting. So if you are reporting to ER for the first time, um, I would definitely bookmark this slide and we'll we'll send all the slides out after the presentation. As Catherine said, they will be posted on IntraHealth's page. This the recording of this webinar, in addition to the slides. Um, but essentially, if you were reporting for the first time to ER, you will be reporting expenditures that happened within the U.S. government fiscal year, fiscal year twenty four, and that period of fiscal year twenty four is October first of twenty twenty three until September 30, 2024. This is based from the perspective of the reporting partner on a cash basis of accounting. So if you spent any dollars between October 1st and September 30, which we're almost there, not there yet, but, um, and those dollars have been spent and they left your bank account at this point, you would be reporting to expenditure reporting um, and you would wanna report those expenditures. You will report the, the spend in US dollars. This is really important. 
um, just like other financial reports you send to you to USAID, these expended the expenditure data should be reported in US dollars and not local currency. We do have some information in our guidance documents on you know how what is the best way to convert currency. Um, it's likely that you have another methodology to convert your other financial reports from local currency to US dollars. You would just use that same methodology um, as well for those, those types of reports. There's different websites that can give um, an average of what the currency conversion is going to be if it fluctuates quite a bit. Um, and so again, do your best to be able to report that, but um, it, please be sure to not report in local currency. You should only report your PEPFAR spend. So if you are an organization that has other USAID funding, let's say malaria money, or let's say your organization does other HIV work and you receive from funds from like the Gates Foundation to do HIV work, you do not count those in PEPFAR expenditure reporting. We are only looking at PEPFAR dollars that were spent. So um, not, not anything else should be included in your, in your ER report. You would need to keep track of those funding sources. And then one thing that is really important, this was a new change for last year, will continue for this year, is that the prime partner is responsible for completing the expenditure reporting process through either of these two methods. And we're gonna go through these together. So you as the prime partner will either need to directly enter all expenditures for your mechanism on behalf of all partners, prime plus sub, into datum itself, or you as the prime partner will need to complete and collect expenditure reporting templates for your own organization, as well as an expenditure reporting template for every subrecipient, regardless of how much money that subrecipient has spent. Every partner, sub or prime, needs to have a template or they need to have their data directly entered into datum. This is just sort of a visual representation of that, um, it's sort of a little bit of a de de decision tree, kind of similar to the, the concept that I just raised. It We need to ensure that the prime is responsible for just their information, collecting the subrecipient, but all of it needs to be submitted into datum. So let's break down the three options. If you are a prime partner on this webinar, um, pay attention to kind of these three options that you have available. That first option that I said is that you complete templates and then you upload those templates. So the prime partner will have their own template. And let's say that your mechanism has two sub awards. What we would need to see is three templates uploaded to datum. One template for the prime, one template for one sub, and then one template for the second sub. So we would have three templates uploaded to datum, completed and uploaded. You do not combine expenditures into one template. It's every template per organization um, for ER. So option one is completing a template and then uploading it. If you don't want to complete a second, uh, a separate template, and let's say you want to go directly into Datum. Datum is the system where you submit the data. Everybody, all, all of the prime partners will need to go into Datum and submit the data. Um, and so you can choose to do a separate work offline on a template, or if you as an organization say, we're going to have to log into Datum to submit the data anyways, let's just enter the, datum di the data directly into datum, that's your second option. But the example still holds. If you, if this mechanism has one prime partner and two subrecipients, you would add your information as the prime. And then as you can see in number two, you would click a button that says add subrecipient. And then you would type that subrecipient data in for subrecipient one. You'd click add subrecipient for that number two organization, type in that expenditure data, 
and then you've completed the, the requirement for those three different organizations. The third option you have is what's sort of a hybrid option, and that is where you can essentially mix and match. Let's say for the prime, I would like to complete the template because that's just easier for, or let's say for the prime, I would like to enter in the information directly because that's just easier. But let's say I have 20 subrecipients. It might be easier to send out, to email out 20 templates and ask those subrecipients to complete those templates, send them back to me, and then me as the prime partner, I'm going to review them for accuracy and review to make sure there's no errors. And then I will upload all of those templates um, on behalf of those subrecipients. So you can do one, you can do the other, you can do both if you would like. It, it really doesn't matter. Um, I'll reemphasize this later in a couple more slides, but because the prime partner is the organization that has the relationship with USAID, that is why the prime partner is the only entity that is responsible for submitting the data, for coordinating the collection of the data. Subrecipients do not have a contractual relationship directly with USAID. The subrecipients have that contractual relationship with the prime, and then it's the prime and USAID who have an award agreement. So the prime partner, unfortunately, has the responsibility of coordinating with the subs to collect the sub data, and then the responsibility of reporting on behalf of all subs. If you are a subrecipient organization on this webinar, you must submit expenditures, but you're submitting them to the prime. You do not need to go into the online data submission system to submit. You just need to submit to the prime. But keep in mind that you would want to do that with good time so that the prime partner has time to review. Okay. So that, that is essentially kind of your options to on um, sort of the mechanics of how to report. Let's talk about just a couple of things that are new for this year if you have reported to ER this year, if, you, if you've already reported to ER in the past. The first is we spent a lot of time as, as, as USG and PEPFAR to clarify some of our guidance based on the questions and comments that we've received from partners. So none of the classifications and categories have substantially changed. We've just clarified definitions and guidance and added more um, examples of activities that are included or excluded. Um, one of the other things that has changed on both the budgeting side and now you will see on the expenditure side, um, for anyone who may have reported to ER in the past, you may be looking at the template and say, I thought key populations had more disaggregates. Let's say key populations, I can only see key populations in the template, but I used to be able to see um, men who have sex with men, sex workers, and people who inject drugs. Why do I only see key populations now? This was a change that we made um, a year or so ago on the budgeting side. And so now again, we, we ro report expenditures, the same uh, classification as our budgets. And we are going to essentially, we're essentially working on what's called targeted beneficiaries versus allocated beneficiaries. I don't want you as partners to worry about this too much because at the end of the day, what you're going to see is sort of a streamline in the beneficiaries that you will report to in the template. So there are fewer beneficiaries that you have to report to. Um, but one thing that is, again, really important for you to reach out to your ACOR or activity manager and get that budget by the different interventions is because when we set budgets, we basically set them according to um, beneficiaries that are targeted, but those, the definition of a targeted beneficiary has to meet these two criteria. So activities that are planned for the population that are specialized and targeted to meet the specific needs of that group, 
And then those costs are separate and identifiable from work for other beneficiary groups. So just sort of in like really easy, like what is the easy way of saying that? If there are activities that we know are targeting AGYW, we know what those activities are and we know what they cost, then in the budgeting process, we selected AGYW. If we sort of are planning general activities and they're not really being, they're not really targeting anybody, AGYW may be included, but we're not specifically targeting them, then we just would have said that the budget would have been targeting a non-targeted population. That's what we would have selected. So when you see those budgets by intervention, that is why for those that may be familiar um, with ER in the past, why you, you see fewer categories, it's because we have sort of streamlined our, our beneficiary budgets and expenditures to be a targeted, um, a targeted group. But that doesn't mean that we don't see those, um, that disaggregating data by let's say MSM. Now for partners, I'm going to explain what's called an allocated beneficiary you do not have to worry about this. This is going to be something that will automatically be done for you. Um, once your results data has been submitted and your ER data has been submitted, there will be calculations done on the back end so that rather than say how much you spent by MSM in the, in the ER template, we will calculate that automatically for you based on the proportion of targets for that population group. If, and I don't have like a pointer or anything here, but if we look at the example on the left, we can see that this partner reported $10 million for non-targeted care and treatment. And so when we look at the partner's MER results, this partner said that they had 200 MSM TX curve. Of the total TX curve for this partner, if we, if we add that whole row of TX curve, all of those disaggregates, then we essentially can see that 200 MSM TX curve represents 20% of those results. 20% of the TX curve results are MSM. If we multiply 20% by that 10 million that was spent on care and treatment, we can then allocate automatically $2 million um, as the partner spend on MSM. You do not have to do this, it will be done for you. But we do want to let partners know that this calculation of, with, with your data is going to happen. So you will be reporting on these targeted beneficiaries, which again, is, is saying that we are specifically targeting this one group and there's dollars amount allocated, but then, this, so this is what you're reporting, but then also we're going to calculate allocated beneficiaries that's going to be a little bit more disaggregated um, based on your MER results. So if you have any questions on this, I don't wanna spend a ton of time on it because it's really not that relevant for ER reporting it's more relevant for the data interpretation questions, which I'm happy to talk about either at the end of this or offline if any partners have any questions because, you know, 20% allocation of MSM is not perfect, um, but it is a way to make reporting easier for partners. Um, and at least we're all using sort of a same methodology for um, this auto allocation that happens um, but I, this is not anything that you have to worry about in the template. You're only reporting on the higher level targeted beneficiaries. So again, happy to take questions of that um, later on. So another thing that is, it's not really new. It's I think the words that we're using are, are new, but when you go into data, what the process will be is let's say that you are entering the data directly you will need to be sure to enter the data and click save. Let's say you're done and you're ready to submit. You need to not only click save, but then there's another button and it's, it will be very clear and there are a number of resources to help, um, help kind of orient you to the screen. After you hit save, you must hit validate because then once you hit validate, 
the datum system will run a number of data quality checks to make sure that your data submitted is valid. Once you have passed that first initial check, you will then need to go into the data approval app, which again, there's instructions, step-by-step -step instructions on how to do this and click the submit mechanism button. So you cannot just go into datum, enter in your expenditures and just click save and then exit out and say, I'm done. This is a three-step process. You click save, you click validate, and then you click submit mechanism. Only then can we see your data. If you only click save, we will never see your data. It just won't come through the system. If you only click validate, we will still not see your data. Please be sure to mark this down. You need to click through three times in order to ensure that the system fully processes, validates, and, and submits your data. Another thing that is new this year that um, hopefully for those partners, every year we get partners that are interested in a data set you submit your data to us and you want to run your own analytics or you want to be able to um, see your data visualized so that you can do internal presentations or something, you can now do that this year and export your expenditure data in a structured data set format using what was called a Datum Genie app. When you log into Datum, you will see on step one on the far left, you'll see this little icon that says Genie. You'll click on that. You'll click on the ER financial structure data set report type option. You'll run the report and then it will automatically um, download a data set for you as a reference. This is similar to anyone who may be familiar, familiar with this on the MER side. Partners can do this with their MER data. It's something called a data gene, the Datum Genie um, app, which will allow you to download your data. You could do it with MER. You can now do it with your expenditure data. Okay, so those are the only things that are new. Let's talk a little bit more about the deadlines. And so we essentially have two major deadlines. The first is November 15th. And that is going to be the, the initial submission for both your ER and your HRH reports. So basically, data will open on October 1st for, for entry. And so you have from October 1st until November 15th to submit that data. Once you submit the data by November 15th, there is some data processing that happens. And we at USAID then take the data sets that we have, all of your data is essentially processed and a, a data set is created. And then we go through a number of data quality checks. Your activity manager will also go through a number of data quality checks. And so USAID will usually review the first week of December. So just because you submitted your report by November 15th, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're done because there may be a couple of things that we catch once we analyze the data and perform some data quality checks. So please still keep an eye out from the beginning of December until our final submission deadline on December 13th because your activity manager may say, hey, we found that you are missing half of your expenditures. Your budget was a million, you only submitted 500,000. What happened? Are you missing something? That's happened actually quite a bit. And so the partner will say, oops, we forgot to report you know, another $400,000. And you'll need to pull that report down from Datum, correct it, re-upload it, and submit it into Datum by that December 13th deadline. So November 15th is usually kind of the deadline when everyone tries to get their data in. I would really aim to ensure that at least your first draft is, is submitted by this November 15th deadline, because again, we have these data quality checks that we like to run. These are hard deadlines. We cannot accept late data, especially by December 13th, if you say, um, we had XYZ technical issues. 
can we please just submit on December 14th? The answer is no. I do not control the system. Actually, no one even at USAID controls the system. We have no ability to open it back up to allow partners to submit if they miss this deadline. And what that means is in January and February, when USAID sits down to do budgeting and strategic planning, we look at all of your data, we, we really do. Um, if we do not have data for you, it, it's a problem because we then aren't able to say, this is what this partner spent their money on. This is what their MER results look like. These are the levels in which we would want to budget for them next year in a more accurate way. Um, we have a lot of discussions with other stakeholders and they want to better understand PEPFAR investments. And if we're missing data, then we're not showing a true picture of what um, PEPFAR is really spending its money on. So please be sure that I, if I were you, I would try to aim to get my submission in by the day before these deadlines, because everyone is going to be, everyone around the world is going to be trying to submit their report in the exact same week and on the exact same day. And so the system where you will submit the data, which is called datum, um, it will be, uh, sometimes it will be slow. Um, there are times where you will need to reach out to the help desk for support, and it can take a few days. If there, there's a very long queue. People have their accounts disabled, but they need to be reactivated. There's um, questions with, I can't seem to submit, I don't know why, so they need support from the help desk. There are many reasons why you don't want to wait, because again, these are hard deadlines. And if you wait until the last day to submit, and then all of a sudden you're getting errors and you just can't figure out what's going on, um, we, there's nothing we can do about it. Um, I think uh, ER is more straightforward and our, it's, it's kind of simpler in its design. HRH, if you are an organization that is um, that has not submitted an HRH inventory template before, HRH can be overwhelming. Um, I so the the webinar on Thursday will cover HRH. So I won't get too much into HRH today um, because another group of folks are going to cover that very comprehensively. But ER, it still can be tricky if it's your first time. But HRH especially. There's a lot of, I mean, I, I, I'm so sorry <laughs> that you all, that, that inventory, it's a lot of elements and there can be a lot of validation errors that prevent your submission. So don't wait. And then uh, I think I have just a couple more slides and then let's just do a demo here and look at the template. So one of the reasons why um, I think, I guess this is kind of sort of a change but I think many of you that have done ER in the past will remember that the U.S. government, um, in an attempt to address a lot of security concerns that there are cybersecurity concerns and keeping data safe, particularly your organization's financial data and the data that you're sending to us um, over the internet, I mean, it contains very sensitive procurement information about what you do and how you spend your money and what your makeup is, your indirects, your NICRAs. And so um, the U.S. government as a whole is working to be more secure in its online systems and how we safeguard data. This is, again, especially in HRH, when you think about how sensitive the HRH data is. So what I think a lot of us around the world are, are doing for this, but for many things, is we need to have um, additional security for submitting data via um, a multi-factor authentication process. And that is a um, essentially a single sign-on through this site called Okta. And you will need to create an Okta account, which is, um, it will enable you, it's sort of the first step before you are able to log into Datum. If, you, if, this, if you're hearing this for the first time, you can no longer just go to datum.org and then log in. You will be prompted to, you will be redirected to this screen on the right and you will need to have a username and a password set up as well as an authentication code 
that you would enter as a step number one. And again, this is purely for security. Once you do this, you will then be redirected to datum and then everything else will look the same. Nothing else will look different, but we have to take this first step, all of us, myself included, all of us have to log into this Okta account first that just says that you're going to verify your identity twice um, or verify that um, we're safeguarding this data. If you have reported to ER in the past, you should have received an email, um, and I can't even remember when we did this. I think it was in April or May when they rolled out Okta. And so you can try to look through your spam box or an inbox. You should have received an email from the account that is registered that you, that you use to log into Datum that gives you instructions on how to create your Okta account. If you either did not receive that email or you have not set up your Okta account, I dropped a link at the bottom, which is a help desk. And you can click on that help desk and submit a ticket to get your Okta account. Again, once you log into Okta, it will just take you right to Datum and everything else will be the same. Um, then we're talking about your Datum account then, for those of you um, who have logged into Datum in the past 95 days, you should be able to then just automatically go into Datum and just you know work as normal. If you have not logged into Datum in the past 95 days, which is honestly probably most of us, myself included, because we only do ER once a year, if you have not logged into Datum in the past 95 days, your account is deactivated and you will need to follow these instructions to reactivate the account. It should be very simple, but you'll just need to follow these steps and submit a help desk ticket in order to get that account reactivated again. If you have never logged into Datum before, and this is your first time doing ER, um, click on that, that link down at the bottom, the register.datum.org. And again, someone will create an account for you. So I'm going to go back two slides and revisit the timeline. One of the first things that I would do as an organization is I would sort who is going to be responsible for submitting the ER and the HRH report. It would be beneficial to have multiple people identified. People leave the organization, people are sick, whatever it may be. Try to, depending on however large your organization is, have one or two or three people create an Okta account, create a Datum account. Um, and as you can see in those instructions that we just went over, it could take a few days just to get an account. That is one of the first things that I would do if, if, if it was me, is get your account access sorted because it could take a few days. You don't want to wait until November 14th to realize I don't, I can't figure out this Okta thing. I don't, I don't know what's going on with my datum account. You will probably not get a response by November 15th. I would sort out your account information. You can start it now. Datum does not open until October 1st. So if you want to sort out internally who is going to have the accounts, get them started to get their Okta account set up. And then October 1st, make sure that those people can log in and that you can see your mechanism. This is the second thing that every year, I don't know why, but there's mechanisms that are missing. I would want, I would, if it was me, identify your people, make sure they have their accounts, go into Datum and ensure that you can see the mechanism that you're reporting to. Do that in the beginning weeks of October when it's still kind of quiet. Okay, a couple more things. Sorry, I think I have one more and then let's do a demo. The only other thing here, I won't spend a lot of time on this. It's a reference slide for you. And this mostly will apply to subrecipients when you submit your template or when your data is entered um, in Datum. Is something called a unique entity identifier. Prime partners have this because again, you already have that award and relationship with us as the US government. So you already have a UEI, it's already in the system. You don't, as a prime partner, you don't need to worry about this. But subrecipients, some subrecipients have a unique identity, a unique entity identifier, some do not. 
Here is some guidance when you are completing your template on the UEI. If you know what your UEI is, you can enter that in the template and we'll see that in just a second. If you don't know what your UEI is as a SEP recipient, you will enter in the number one 12 times into the certain field we'll, we'll look at. So you'll enter in one, 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 one. You'll enter that in 12 times and that will, that will clear the responsibility. If a subrecipient is not required to have a UEI, like um, we have some awards from WHO, um, they would just report the number nine 12 times. TBD subrecipients should not be reporting any data because you know they're not named, so they can't really spend money if we don't have them awarded yet. Um, and then any of the government to government awards or G to G, um, you would enter in that same digit number one 12 times. Okay, that was a lot of me talking. I'm gonna talk a little bit longer. Um, just to go through the template and the, or just to go through data entry, we'll talk about data um, submission, and then I will stop for a very long time to take questions. So if you remember, we talked about there's two options that the prime partner has for submitting the data. Again, you must collect all of the prime plus the sub, but the mode in which you submit the data is up to you. You can do it online, which is option number one, just go into data and enter it directly. Or you can do option number two, which is complete a template. You can also do a mix if you would like to have some online and some in a template. Because Datum is not yet open, I cannot go into Datum and show you directly how to do that data entry. But I will switch over to um, the template so that you can have an idea of how we enter in information. And it's the exact same, whether it's the template or it's online, it's the same. So let me go to the template. Okay. You can, and let me also orient you to where we're at. One, this is another um, page that you will want to bookmark. This is where all partners can find pretty much any information that you will want to know about expenditure reporting and HRH. I think the HRH data is not quite here yet, but all of the ER data is ready. You can go there right now and find all of this information. We're going to go and click on, and we have the website here that we'll link to, but um, just stick with me for a little bit as I will walk us through what this all looks like. We're going to click on PEPFAR guidance, and in this PEPFAR guidance page, we're going to go to expenditure reporting. And again, this is all updated now for this year. Classifications reference guide, and I'm gonna move this out of the way. I already opened this, but for the person that had the question on lab, this is a document that has all of the information that you would like to know about how to report to ER. It has the definitions of the program areas, of the beneficiaries, the cost categories, things like that. So let's say, again, we had a question on um, VMMC for service delivery, non-service delivery. What are some of activities that are, if I wanted to report my expenditures as the service delivery or non-service delivery, what are some included examples? What are some examples of non-service delivery? And then we can see that here. And that will help guide you to determine where those expenditures go um, in the ER template. We This is a breakdown also of, um, we're still in program area, we also have the beneficiaries. These are a little bit more straightforward, but if you're looking for definitions on the beneficiaries um, or just a little bit more information of the disaggregates, you can find that here. There is the explanation that I gave on allocated beneficiaries. If you would like more to read more about that, that's available to you. And then we also have um, the cost categories. If you want to know where something should, which cost category something should go, you can look here. What is the definition of healthcare worker ancillary? It's the salaries for persons employed by the partner who have non-clinical training and provide services directly to the client. Um, this is an example of if you have where 
you know, if you wanted to put expenditures under this category, this is what would be included. If you have any questions on, you don't have to read this entire document. Let's say that you just want to find um, a, a certain category, um, like we're looking here at lab or we're looking at, at lab reagents and the rental charges that are associated with that. If you want to look at office rent, for example, I just did a control F, a control find, and I can see that my office rent for my organization, the utilities, all of those contracts, that's going to go on the other contracts cost category. So definitely um, bookmark this document, this page here, the financial classifications reference guide. It's where you'll find all of the definitions. Um, there's a section here that is more on kind of the, the nuts and bolts of ER reporting. We went through what's new. Here is the template. Again, it's live. You can download that fiscal year 24 template today. There are instructions. There's actually a demo on how to do the online entry. I won't click on that, but you can walk, you can see someone walk through that on how they go about entering data directly into Datum. And again, we talked about that financial classifications reference guide. So I went ahead and I already downloaded the ER template and let's go through this together. So the first thing that you'll see down here at the bottom, and I'll try to, to zoom in here a little bit, um, hopefully it'll be a little bit easier, but down at the bottom, we have basically three main tabs. We have a tab that is identifying information for the subrecipient. We have the expenditure data that should be reported by either the prime or a subrecipient with expenditures greater than 25,000. And then we have one tab where a subrecipient would report expenditures if the total amount is less than 25,000. Now remember, we are doing one template per organization. And so if I am a prime partner, I'm going to complete the prime or subs over 25K tab, and it will be just my expenditures in this one template for me as the prime, one template per organization. If I have two subrecipients and one subrecipient has expenditures that are $50,000, I would send a blank copy of this template to my sub that have spend that is more than 25,000 and ask them to complete this tab just for their organization. And then if I have one sub that spent less than 25,000, I would again send them a blank template and I would ask them to go to this third tab and complete subrecipients under 25K. And the reason why we have two different tabs is just that it's to it's sort of a it's to reduce the amount of reporting for partners. So there's some sub partners that only spend ten thousand dollars. Well, you know we care about what that ten thousand dollars is by these different cost categories, but we care a little bit more about the organizations that spend more than twenty five thousand. So if it's more than 25,000, we really do want to see the breakdown and the detail by the cost category. But if it's just this one organization has spent less, then we just ask for the top line total expenditure. So let's go through um, and run a couple of different scenarios for how we would complete this. I'm first going to start on the subrecipients under 25,000 tab. So um, let's say then, because I'm a subrecipient, I need to enter in my organization name, partner one, and then my subrecipient U UEI. And we talked about this, right? You either have a UEI and you would enter that in here, or you would enter in that digit number one um, 12 times. We're going to go back and enter in the expenditures. So let's say this organization, I'm just going to pick a few things, does a little bit of HIV clinical services, non-service delivery, does a little bit of testing, um, community-based testing, non-service delivery. And let's say in both cases that, these, that this subrecipient is targeting key populations. I'm going to enter, select these from the drop-down menu, and I'm simply going to say, 
of the care and treatment, clinical services, non-service delivery for key populations, I spent $5,000. And then over here, as a community-based testing, non-service delivery expenditures for key populations, I'm going to say that we spent $2,500. And that's it. That's all this organization did as an example. We can see that the total is less than 25,000. And so that's okay. Let's say that this organization did 50,000 here. We're going to get an error because again, this tab should only be for partners that have spent less than 25,000. If they spent more than 25,000, they're going to go over to this other tab. Now you'll see that we used to see the cost categories over here. We used to see kind of selections um, for columns. We don't see that anymore. Why is this tab all grayed out? Because again, it's one template per organization. We've already entered data into this tab. And so we cannot also add data into this tab. It's one or the other. Okay, and so again, this has to be less than, than $25,000. So we've completed our subrecipient organization tab. We've completed our um, expenditures by intervention. We're done. And I will then uh, ensure that the prime partner has this um, information and the prime partner will be responsible for uploading this template. Now, we're gonna remove this. We go back to the prime or subs over 25K tab. We can see that this is no longer grayed out because we haven't entered anything on this tab anymore. Now, I'm going to enter in my data as a subrecipient that has spent more than 25,000. Again, I need to go over and I need to enter in my name and my UEI or that digit number one uh, 12 times. And it's the same thing. I am going to say that this organization does um, some, let's say some non-biomedical prevention at non-service delivery. We'll say, just because it's here at the top, some care and treatment, HIV clinical services that's non-service delivery. Okay, we still need to pick a beneficiary. Again, these are those targeted beneficiaries. So let's do AGYW. You'll notice that we um, that this is, is sort of a red box and it's because we haven't entered anything yet. Once I entered an AGYW, the red box went away. You have to enter a program area and a beneficiary. Otherwise, this is considered an error and you won't be able to submit. You need to enter both. And so let's also select, or let's select children for this category. Okay. I am going to just enter in some information into these different cost categories to sort of show what it looks like um, when we have data entered. One thing to note as you're entering in information, do not enter in any decimals because it will not be accepted by the system. Please be sure to round up and do not paste anything into these program area and beneficiary categories, because again, it will just somehow break with the structure of the template and datum will not, will not accept it if you paste up here. So we've entered in data for this first intervention. Let me get it a little bit larger. Um, and we can see that this is a non-service. So what are these yellow and these red boxes? What does this mean? Because we have selected a non-service delivery program area, the template is merely saying with these yellow boxes, you should make a review because you selected non-service delivery as a program area, but you're entering in expenditures to a category that seems to be service delivery. Right, so let's say that you are reporting a dollar here for a physician that physician salary that we pay for. So that would be under the healthcare worker clinical salaries. That's probably more of a service delivery related expenditure that we've put in a non-service deli non delivery related um, column. 
That's why in this column where we see service delivery, you don't see a warning here because it's more, it's more service delivery related. But this yellow box does not mean that this is an error. And this is a very common misunderstanding in the template. An error is a red box. Remember when we took out um, a, a beneficiary? You cannot submit the template if it's red. You have to complete, you have to complete, uh, you have to clear the red box. Another example here is at the bottom. Indirect charges are inherently related to program management. We cannot have program related, program management related expenditures in a technical intervention, which is why this is red down here. But if we put some a, a dollar in here, there's not a problem because this is directly related to program management. But we can't have program program management dollars in in technical interventions. So again, another example of this is international travel. We've selected a service delivery program area, but then we have entered in international travel. Do you think that if someone is traveling from Zambia to South Africa, that that is related to direct service delivery? That is related to treating patients at a site? Probably not. It would probably be something that when we go over here is related to non-service delivery. But again, remember, just because you see these yellow boxes does not mean that the template is has an error. It's only when you see the red. So why do we have these yellow boxes? Because if you remember at the beginning, I said, if we had an intervention for every activity, for every program area, for service delivery and non-service delivery for every targeted beneficiary. I mean, we could go off for a very long time on these interventions. We don't, that is not the intention. And so, you know, perhaps this partner does a little bit of service delivery and non-service delivery. And so they are making a decision to lump their expenditures together based on where the majority of the spend is. Let's say that, you know, 90% of what this partner does is non-service delivery. We could ask this partner, or this partner could break out into a separate category and do the non-biomedical prevention service delivery for AGYW. But I mean, if it's 90% of it is going to be here and a very small amount of money here, it's not really necessary for us to see both categories broken out because we are happy and satisfied to know that the majority is being spent on non-service delivery activities. There's a little bit of service delivery, but it would be $100 and we just don't need to see $100 broken out by all these different categories. So that's what the warning is intended to do. What this review is intended to do is just say, are you sure you want to put a dollar in here? And if you say that we only want to report our non-service delivery we are going to lump our service delivery and our non-service delivery together, it's okay to submit the template with the yellow. It's just not okay to submit the template with the red. Okay, again, we were doing this from the perspective of a um, subrecipient with spend of more than 25,000. Again, if we go over to our spend under 25,000, it's all grayed out because you can only have one template per organization. Um, and so um, it would be the exact same if I was the prime partner starting over again. This tab would actually be blank if I was the prime partner because I'm not a sub organization, I'm a prime partner. We already have your name and we have your UEI. Now is the prime, I'm going to enter in my categories for what I as the organization spent my money on um, and then we'll enter it in here. And so this is just the prime partner's expenditures. So that is on basically how you enter in your expenditure data, whether it's the online system or whether it's through the template. Um, I want to go through um, just the documentation that's available to you. Uh, we are talking about data entry. There are really when you go to Datum Zendesk, there are really great PDFs available to you 
that you can click on that will go step by step and show you um, exactly how to go through what we just went through on this webinar. And it will have an overview of the from the prime, how to enter in the data as the subrecipients, um, how to log into datum and how to do that entry, how to access the different um, the different apps where you do your um, do where you do your entry. And then if you also have any questions on um, any of the errors or the warnings that we just talked about, you can go into this document and it will break that down for you. Why do I have that red box? And what is it that I need to do in order to clear it? So again, regard, depending on if you want to do the template or you want to do the, the online entry, there are separate PDF, PDF instructions for you in order to do that. And then the last thing I have, and then I'll take questions and stop talking, is on um, is on data submission. And so again, I can't go into data, so I, there's nothing that I can show you on how to submit, but please be sure to bookmark these PDFs, the template data submission for partners, the direct online entry for partners. How do I actually go about um, um, taking the template and submitting it in the system or doing that online direct entry? It's step by step by step that it's available to you. Um, these are just super valuable sources of information and um, it would be the first place that I would look if I was sitting down to do this for the first time. Okay. Let me, um, actually we're getting close to time. I can speed through the rest of these slides um, they're just resource slides, and then we can just do nothing but Q&A until the rest of the time that we have. But this is just a reminder of um, the website, datum.zendas.com, which is where you should find those PDFs that I just pulled up, that financial classification reference guide with all of those definitions to answer the questions that you have on service delivery, non-service delivery, where does my office rent go, um, et cetera. Um, we talked about, um, we are we looked through those PDFs that will help you clear those warning, those errors, those red boxes so that you can submit. Um, and then the most important thing, also please be sure to bookmark this. And this is essentially the help desk. If for some reason you are just, you've looked through the documentation and you're really just stuck and you don't know what's going on, on Datum Zendesk, there is a section called technical support, and this is where you can submit a request. Again, think about making sure that you start this sooner rather than later because um, the help desk will be supporting everyone around the world on ER and HRH. And so it may be a couple of days for them to be able to respond to the thousands of partners that are all trying to submit two days before the deadline. Um, but but the, the help desk is going to be really um, important for you. My team has disseminated a, a set of USAID specific resources to all of the activity managers at all of the missions. If you have not received um, ER specific materials from your activity manager, please reach out today and say, I think that there was um, information that was sent that will help me as a partner to submit ER, including my budget by intervention, can you please send me these materials to help with ER as soon as possible? It's um, kind of a longer document, but you can again, control find and look for any information that you need to answer any questions. If you need technical assistance, if you're just really stuck, um, for partners that have done ER in the past who were local partners, based in Africa, you may remember that we had some technical assistance consultants who worked with you to help complete ER. Unfortunately, um, again, because as the ASAP2 mechanism is ending, we, do not, we no longer have funding for those consultants, but that doesn't mean that you will not still have technical support. If you have questions, you can reach out to your activity manager. You can contact my team at oha.ea at usa.gov. And then again, the help desk on Datum Zendesk is, I mean, they're really fantastic. 
And there's a lot of things that I can't solve for you if you don't remember your password or if your account has been deactivated. There's nothing that I can do to help you in the system to get that reactivated. So that help desk is really valuable and very often they will route questions to me and my team anyways. And then the last thing is just a reminder about um, some of the common um, kind of common questions that we get from partners. And it's really that difference, that difference between site, which is kind of those categories on the left by program area, by service delivery, non-service delivery, and those expenditures that are above site. Above site expenditures really are only program management and above site. And for that person that had the question on, let's say site level management um, and um, the, the above site, um, that is essentially one of the differences that we have outlined here. Um, we have some non-service delivery costs for facility or at the other, po or other point of service personnel um, that manage some of these programs. We consider that site level work. Those management, there's um, <clears throat> those monitoring and evaluation costs are routine that happen at the site level. They should just be lumped in as, as site level expenditures, which is very different than above site programming. Um, which is more of that HMIS and things like that. So that site level versus non site level versus above site um, can be very different. But we do think that by reporting your expenditures for monitoring and evaluation at the site level is where um, is more appropriate than including that as above site because those HMIS or systems related expenditures are very different from that. Um, that is essentially um, all that I have. Uh, last plug before we take questions for the rest of the time is just um, USA does look at this data quite a bit. We calculate this data in many, many, many different ways. This is not a report that just sits on a computer and never gets looked at. We know that you have, you go through considerable effort for both ER and HRH to complete these reports. We will talk about them extensively from January until May, your data. And so if you have any additional questions on how the US government and how PEPFAR is using financial data to essentially talk about our activities for the next year, do mechanism level budgeting to identify where PEPFAR has efficiencies, identify components of our programming that we may want to transition to let's say the Ministry of Health as we're having our um, sustainability conversations, don't hesitate to reach out to me and we're happy to discuss some of the data use um, further. You can go online to a public site called PEPFAR Panorama Spotlight, and this is where all of the data can be consumed. Um, the, your expenditure data um, can be found here. It's de-identified, so you don't have to worry about any sensitive information here um, about your organization. But again, because we're having a lot of sustainability conversations and what PEPFAR is during, doing versus let's say the Global Fund or versus the Ministry of Health, who's paying for what, what are we doing in non-service delivery? Um, if you were curious about what some of the data looks for the country where you're at, you can go um, and navigate to Panorama Spotlight and see um, a lot of that data, um, that, that spend data. I'm so sorry for talking for a very long time, but um, I will stop there and we have the rest of the time now for questions. Great, so there are several questions for you, Erin. A um, couple of them, multiple folks have asked. One question that has come up a couple of times that should be a quick direct ask is, so if an organization has multiple sub-awards under a prime, should they be submitting one template for each, for just a prime total or one ER template for each, each sub-agreement, sub-awardee? Yes, great question. So, and thank you for all the kudos. I am so sorry for talking that long. <laughs> I know that's tedious. You should be submitting one template for each sub-recipient. There are some cases where, um, and, and our supplemental documentation explains kind of like a tiered system of subrecipients, where like a subrecipient will have their own subrecipients, and that will sometimes go down like two and three and four levels. 
Um, and they're like $5,000 or $1,000. And so maybe for those smaller tiers, if you want to just say um, the tier one subrecipient submits, um, and it, it still is, you know, pretty small amounts of dollars. If you want to combine like three or four very small subrecipients um, expenditures into one template, I think that's fine. We we don't need to see a template of five hundred dollars or twenty five hundred dollars if it's a subrecipient of a subrecipient of a subrecipient. Um, and so I think as you know, a prime like use your judgment. If it's definitely like you know, depending on the size of the award, I mean, we do would we would like to see one template per subrecipient. But if it starts to get like really really small amounts then just you can have that report under that first tier subrecipient. But again, if there's, you know, four or five subrecipients, it should be one per, per subrecipient um, within reason. So another set of questions that we have are really the fixed amount of awards. Um, people are wondering how recipients or subrecipients with fixed amount of awards should be reported um, since it's mentioned that, for example, the prime does not receive financial reporting from these FAAs. Right, great question. We receive this every year. And so we would ask that the fixed amount award partners submit an ER template based on those milestone payments as, as the best of your ability. So it's, it's, again, you don't have to report to us on what was actually um, you know, the, 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 the spend, if it was more or, or than the milestone pay, payment, for example, but what that milestone payment may be breaking that down, um, and to the different categories, um, would be, it's the best of your ability, I think is the most reasonable way for a fixed amount of award to report. So we have another question related to the PEPFAR Panorama site. Are, are we able to have access to prime partner pass reports from that dashboard? So if you go to this website, link down at the bottom, data.pepbar.gov forward slash library, you will be able to go to the finance, there's, there's data sets that are available there, um, but you can also just go to the dashboards. There's a section that I've highlighted on the screen called financial management and you can see these different categories. It's essentially not broken down by prime and sub. It's, it's all of the data combined. I think except for maybe budget execution, which you might have some partner, high level partner visibility on. Um, otherwise it's all just combined at the country level. So we don't even go down to an agency level, nor do we go down to a mechanism level for um, most of these, um, uh, the of the uh, analyses in this um, dashboard. So another question that we have in place or that we have, and I'll just read this straight through. Um, one participant was mentioning they always have an annual budget ceiling in place. Is there any possibility of having a detailed budget for each intervention? Right. <clears throat> so if I think I understand the question correctly, you should, um, you, you actually do have a budget by intervention. Um, because again, the US government sets this during the COP planning process at the beginning of the year. So we, um, as USAID, in our budget planning tool, will say that mechanism one has, uh, we will say this program area plus this beneficiary, and then the total amount. Again, we don't, in our budgeting process, we don't have this middle part, but we do have like the 4.6 million. And so your activity manager has already received this budget broken down by each of these interventions. And so I would recommend that as you reach out, um, again, as I mentioned, we have a number of different resources that we put together as USAID, and that's what number one is. It's the what we call a budget reference file. 
our team essentially um, has extracted all of those budgets broken down by program area and beneficiary. And then there's a, a specific Excel file for every single USAID mechanism around the world that we've sent to all of the different USAID mission POCs. And so you as the partner should, um, should follow up with your activity manager and say, can you please send this to me as a reference? Again, we would like you to report the actual spend, but it's really helpful as a partner, rather than staring at a blank template, to look at how your activity manager budgeted by program area, by beneficiary, and by the top line dollar amount. And then another question that we have, one participant was asking, if our SAM registration expired, uh, what should we do um, when we try updating the SAM registration and it does not succeed? So we cannot re-register the organization as new after two years ago. That is a good question. Um, I would ask your activity manager for guidance on what to do about that or your contracting officer uh, would be a good uh, person as well. The activity manager can also ask the contracting officer as well for the purposes of, and so I would, I would try that first is to reach out for someone at USAID dealing with the contracts and mention that as an issue. If you're starting to not get anywhere or you're not getting a response fast enough, then if you just, in order to meet the deadline, you can, um, if you're a sub recipient, well, I guess if you're a sub recipient, you can enter in that in our first bullet, that number one, 12 times. If you're a prime partner, um, I would investigate that as soon as possible with again, your activity manager. And you probably, I would, I would start with the contracting officer because I'm not quite sure the details of SAM.gov and why that would expire. Um, so they may be able to help you a little bit more. So currently there are no further questions that are in the question and answer window, but if, if folks have any other questions, feel free to ask. Um, I also see three hands, um, three hands that have been raised as well. If folks have questions, make sure to please put them into the question and answer window. And yeah, I'm not sure that we um, are able to take people off of mute. Everyone's on mute. If you are able to put it in the chat, that's helpful. Maybe um, if we are still gathering questions from the Q&A, can we, can I please ask someone from IntraHealth to put our, our last poll up and ask that you kindly um, click through the poll answer once it's shown up on the screen. All right, we've got our poll live. You can just take one or two seconds. It's much appreciated. Again, we do look at this information in order to determine what resources we can create or how we can better clarify questions to help our local partners, especially with and, and those that are reporting for the first time. And you can be honest. I, I see a couple of those I have nowhere to start and that's okay too. You can reach out to, to those of us, um, uh, either either myself or the oha.ea at usa.gov and, and we'll get you fixed up. And so Aaron, we have a couple more um, questions for you here in the question and answer. So first, uh, someone was mentioning that they missed the FAA related response. They asked, if I manage to claim all the milestones, but my expenditure is less than what I have, which cost should I put on ER? 
I, I mean, I think I would sort of do your best to estimate um, efforts in those different cost categories. And again, it would be based on the milestone that you payment that you received and maybe just kind of, again, that best guess on um, the different cost categories. I apologize that we don't have better guidance for the fixed amount awards you know, it's, and I acknowledge that a expenditure reporting requirement is sort of counter to a fixed amount award type. Um, ER came first, I think, or at least um, we have only recently started doing fixed amount awards as USAID and our, US, and our localization efforts um, much, much more than what we have in the past. So I do acknowledge that it is very tricky in order to determine how to complete ER because of the nature of a fixed amount award, um, which is why the, the, there's not going to be 100% perfect guidance on this. And so I think we just sort of uh, recommend that you do your best in your reporting um, by the different cost categories, by that milestone. We acknowledge it's not perfect. Um, but when you think about as you're reporting your expenditure data, um, you know, you're telling us a story about what you spent your funding on. And this is sort of applicable to all organizations on the call. But um, if when you look, when you think about the data that you're reporting, you want it to really reflect the work that you're doing, the intensity in certain categorizations more than others. If you really um, are investing a lot in, you know, uh, prevention, but we don't see a lot of dollars reported to prevention, we might ask, you know, you know, well, why is there not a lot of dollars that were categorized under prevention, for example? You know, this organization saying they do more care and treatment, but we know that they do more prevention. What's going on? So um, I think starting with that budget reference file that you'll get from your activity manager is a good framework to help you understand Again, a fixed amount of award um, is very different, but um, just do your best with the different categorizations um, and, and thinking about what makes the most sense on how your organization operated in order to achieve the work that you did and to implement, I think is, is the best that we can ask for given the complexity of that award type. Um, but um, asking for that budget reference file from your activity manager is a good place to start. The next question that we have is related to whether or not this training and the HRH training will be done in French later again this year. I believe that um, ASAP had that, that list with dates for the trainings that they presented earlier uh, before we started our own slide deck. Yes, a huge thanks to IntraHealth for moving mountains in their last couple of months of implementation. Uh, we will be offering both the ER and the HRH webinar, the one today and the one on Thursday. They will be offered in French and Portuguese. Um, and we can, we can um, I'm not sure, maybe Catherine, you can um, either, we can show the screen again, or you can let us know the next steps for registering for those webinars. Um, because I do not have those dates, but we will be sure as part of the follow-up to note what those dates are. And similar to how you registered for this webinar, um, you can please uh, register for those two as well. Um, and I, I believe that the dates were around the end of the month. So they are coming in the next couple of weeks. I'm, I, I don't have it off the top of my head because I just saw it. Um, two hours ago what the what the dates are, but there will be, I'm sure, an email distributed with those dates in the registration link. Um, but it will be on or around um, the end of September and the beginning of October for both French and Portuguese for both ER and HRH. And now for the next question, Erin. So we have a participant asking, if I have a large budget and I spend more than $25,000, what would be the case? 
So um, I think if this is in regards to reporting, if you are <clears throat> if you are an organization that um, that um, like let's say that the total mechanism is a hundred thousand dollars, but my organization only spent twenty five thousand dollars. Then, as a subrecipient, you would be under here um, on this tab, the twenty five thousand. And maybe there's you know fifteen or twenty different subrecipients. And the sum total of all of those subrecipients will make the total mechanism be over one hundred thousand dollars. What still matters is that the organization itself is spending; it's it's what they're spending, the over or the under twenty five. Regardless of the prime partner, if you are spending more or less than twenty five, the prime partner will always report on this for the second tab, the primes or subs over twenty five k. So as a prime partner, you will always report um, the expenditures by cost category and the subrecipients. Um, it will just depend on whether your organization spends more or less than twenty five thousand. I, I hope that covers the question. Uh, we have also another comment slash question that is in the chat. A participant was saying, I believe um, it needs a close follow-up on the progress and mentoring. As for the question itself, any milestones to cross-check for correct use of reporting? I am new. Great. And I so I think, Song, for me, you broke up just kind of a minute um, for a second. Um, but I think that this question is asking about kind of data quality checks. Does that sound right, Song? Uh, they mentioned on. milestones to cross-check for correct use of reporting. Okay. I do think that that's with regard to how to report correctly to ER. Um, again, put you please feel free to put in more detail if this answer isn't getting to what you're looking for. But um, again, I highly encourage partners start with datum datum Zendesk, you're going to have to go to this website anyways um, to download the template right here. But if you are a new partner, um, all of the resource materials that will that you will need in order to successfully to submit will be here. There is a checklist for partners that you can click on um, that is, it's fairly detailed, but you can kind of go through whatever maybe makes the most sense for you. But it's intended to assist partners to make sure that you've gone through all of the necessary steps um, in order to be prepared to submit your template or to enter your data indirectly into the system. And so you can go through this checklist to sort of tick off those different, you know, maybe milestones as to whether or not you're a prime, whether or not you're a sub, all of the different modes of entry and the different sort of um, uh, different sort of things that you need to click on when you are preparing to submit the, the data for the prime as well as all of the subrecipients. Um, the only other thing um, that I will say is just that each of these uh, PDF files that we went through, let's just click on one for the template. Um, they have detailed sections on where an error or a warning may be so that let's say that you completed your template for the first time. Let's just say that you're doing the template. Um, and so you think that you're ready to submit the data, but you just want to make sure that you're not missing anything. You can open up these PDFs and they will, um, they will walk through the different um, warn error checks that you can do. Again, whether you're a prime, whether you're a sub, what your dollar threshold amount is, and it will help explain it. Basically, if you are doing ER, and you are looking at a template either as the prime or you are reviewing the templates from the subrecipients, 
you don't want to see anything that's red. That is essentially the, the biggest thing that you'll want to check. If there is anything that is red in this template, you need to resolve it here before you even try to go into datum. If there's something in here that's yellow, then that is okay. And that is something that, you know, you don't have to worry about um, as far as like, will I be able to successfully submit? Um, but if you just cannot clear, so as long as you only see blank cells and yellows and you've reviewed those yellows and you said, I still want to proceed, you can proceed and you can submit and it will most likely not be a problem. Don't forget that you still have to go into the system and click on that save, save, validate and submit because that's where a number of the data quality checks happen. But as long as you're not seeing any red in this template, you're probably going to be okay. I would just say, um, again, one of the first things that I would do if you are a new partner and you're concerned on kind of where to start, I would begin by sorting out um, the accounts. So who is going to, who from my organization will be the person responsible for going into the system and submitting? And, or mold, again, I suggest multiple people identified to do that and ensure that all of their account access is set up before the end of October. So you have a month and a half, and this shouldn't take long. This, even if you're, it's even easier if you're doing it for the first time. Um, but I, that is one thing that I would do is make sure that you can log in and you can see your mechanism, get familiar with the system. It's not a complicated system. It's, there's not a lot you can do in it other than submit data. You, you, there's no other actions you can really take. It will all be quite straightforward. You can go to these different PDFs for help, but um, these are, I think, some of the areas in which you can do your own checks um, to make sure that you are on track for um, reporting on time setting some deadlines for yourself internally. USAID often will have their own deadlines. Um, you know, I mentioned that these are the deadlines in the system, but uh, very often a USAID mission staff will say, the deadline is November 15th, but we would like to see all of your reports in the system a week earlier. We have encouraged USAID um, managers to not do those early deadlines as much as possible because we think that partners are given six weeks to do ER because it takes six weeks. There is still time between essentially December 2nd and December 13th for USA to do our review and come back to you and say, we found this is missing or this doesn't seem right, or you reported more results for TX Kerr and you didn't report any testing or any uh, treatment expenditures, there's a number, there's still time for USAID for those of us at missions and headquarters to do a review. So if there's any USAID staff that are on the webinar still, um, please just try to encourage, let your partners have the time that they need to do um, the reporting. And then we will still have time after November 15th to do a review. The most important thing is we, we get in that, that, that data by November 15th. If you miss the deadline of November 15th, you still have until December 13th to submit your data, but we really like to see at least a draft by November 15th. Um, I know that we are at time, we're actually a minute over. I'm happy to stay online for additional questions, but of course, if you need to drop off, please do so. Um, I, um, thank you all for Attending, again, IntraHealth will post these slides as well as the presentation to their website in probably a couple of days on the ASAP website. And we will also have a follow-up message on when the French and Portuguese dates will be. Please attend the HRH webinar on Thursday. It will be a great webinar um, led by my HRH colleagues, but um, yeah, happy to stay on later if there are any additional questions, but thank you all for the time. I know that that was a lot of one person talking. Thank you.
And Song just checking in to see if there's any final questions that are coming through. No questions at the moment. To the question in the chat about when the video will be up, as Aaron mentioned, it will take a couple days before the video resource is up from what it sounds like. And be sure to make sure to bookmark or save that link to be able to access it. Okay, thank you all for the emojis. It's much appreciated. Um, and thank you all for the time. Um, we will be in touch if there's no final questions. Thank you all. And um, yeah, excited to uh, excited to get going on a new year of expenditure reporting. Thank you.